All right. Hello, everyone. Come on in. Welcome to class. Welcome to my home. Class is in my home today. As usual, that's, that's weird. Hello, hello. Who's there? Anybody here yet? I trained you to to know that I start for two minutes late and then I start on time once. Oops. Okay. Hey there. Anybody else here? Just one? Cool. All right. Great. Yeah. I Currently, it still shows me, just to give you a little picture of what my screen looks like, I've got zero viewers. I wonder what happens if I refresh it. Still here. Okay. Anyway, hey everybody, um, welcome. Today is, is one, actually one of my favorite topics. Um, favorite for a few reasons. One, because I've done a lot of research in the area of disinfection. Um, but I also, I find that it's, there's a lot of interesting opportunities, interesting strategies we can use for disinfection. And I think that a lot of people can relate to it um, in terms of it's very practical, tangible. You, you can, um, it's very easy to see the relevance. So hopefully this will be a, a, a good lecture today. Um, I still have not been able to find my um, Lifesaver ultrafiltration bottle. Maybe I'll Google that for you uh, to show you what I was talking about. Um, but I'll, I'll keep looking. I think it might be in the house, or maybe I left it at um, at the office. Um, I did check today a little bit at the office in the lab. But at any rate, so disinfection is what we're going to talk about today. If you didn't see, I, I emailed everybody. I posted the next homework along with three participation quizzes. I'm sorry that I blasted you with them all at the same time, but I, they really are five to 10 minutes each, probably less than 10 minutes. Um, and I put them due the day after the exam, so you don't have to worry about that if you don't want to, or you can use it as you're studying for the exam. Either way, I hope it's not too burdensome. Um, so I posted the homework and those, um, so keep that in mind. Um, as we move forward. Okay, so disinfection. Um, the first thing that I like to talk about when discussing disinfection is what is the difference between something that is sterile and disinfected? So uh, anybody here, could you give me a, an idea, maybe a quick definition, what, what you think that difference would be? Um, so first of all, if you describe something disinfected as disinfected, can you also say that that is sterilized? Um, that's really the question. Um, to answer your question, um, yes, uh, this next exam is only membranes, granular filters, and disinfection. And the homework covers all three of those categories. So it's a little bit smaller in scope. A lot of the concepts we learned in the first uh, first little while, while certainly apply as well. Um, okay, so I guess the answer might might partly be on the screen already, but normally I like to have people raise their hands in class. So if you could just say yes or no, can you describe something that has been disinfected as also sterilized? So if you disinfect water, is it also sterile? Yes, no, maybe. Okay, we've got a no. We've got no. No. Okay, and then everybody else is scrambling to uh, to Google the, the strict definition. No, I'm just kidding. That's just me wishful thinking that everybody was participating today. No, but I, I do appreciate you guys. So if, if anybody, you know, feel free to um, to put whatever answer here. Um, 
and you are you can uh, yes and, and you can um, you can certainly look up online I don't mind there's also probably a little bit of a, a delay um, here okay so yeah you guys are right it's you cannot guarantee that something is sterilized if you disinfected it now if you disinfect it enough then you might reach sterility but as we define here we're really saying disinfection is the um, removal of infectious pathogens so something that is actually bad for our health something that could cause disease or uh, illness of some sort at infectious levels so we can actually have 10 e coli in our drinking water we could have botulinum bacteria in my drinking water and so long as they haven't produced toxins and it's at a, a dose that's not going to um, uh, cause any issues inside of me I can drink it and that's we would call that disinfected um, so exactly you're exactly right sterility is the uh, the case where we make the pathogens or the viruses bacteria whatever it is um, we destroy them completely so that they cannot reproduce and so if you think about it um, you if you're talking about let's say an animal or a let's say a, a donkey right we would describe certain hybrid hybridized animals as or uh, excuse me like a, a mule okay a donkey and a horse together we get a mule well mules are inherently sterile because um, they have no capability of reproducing so that same terminology is applying even if we don't destroy the microbe but we can prevent it from uh, multiplying we can still call that sterile um, most microbes must reproduce as part of the infection to be a problem most of the time you're you only need to ingest some you know tens hundreds in a few cases thousands or millions of uh, bacteria in order to acquire a sickness but then they reproduce and then they're reproducing so fast that you end up with um, millions billions maybe even trillions of those particular organisms all causing problems in your system and that's an active infection um, so we'll take a look at a few different types in the infectious doses that we're talking about but really sterility is doing that to all living organisms so we we want that we, we did that for the space station um, and in particular for the uh, the Mars rover that just landed on Mars recently we wanted to make sure there's no life that we sent there um, there are a few organisms that may actually be able to survive space and um, we just don't know quite so they took very careful precautions to destroy everything um, so that if we did find something that was in some way living or had some uh, life type um, characteristics then we would not confuse that with something we brought so there's an example there and in my lab I was actually just showing somebody this morning how to use essentially what's a pressure cooker um, as an autoclave we we can use autoclaves to heat water or liquids or even some items up above boiling point by pressurizing it and doing that pressure cooking and that's going to get us a temperature that denatures um, proteins and if you are at a temperature that's de denaturing all sorts of proteins you can pretty much guarantee that dna and other essential proteins for organisms are going to be denatured um, we're going to talk next time a little bit about ultraviolet light Here's a, a picture of an ultraviolet light chamber where water would be flowing through, through this contact chamber with UV rays emitting um, as the water is flowing by. And these systems work in a somewhat similar manner. They are able to damage DNA, um, cause essentially, if you think about like DNA like a zipper that can unzip to div divide and then. Uh, Rezip to when you multiply it, when you multiply it and get more DNA. Essentially, you're putting like super glue in little spots between the links, and then the zipper can't zip up or down and it's stuck. And so, 
UV can cause DNA damage to prevent replication. And maybe if you do that enough times in a given cell, then you've prevented that cell from multiplying. So maybe there are some living cells, maybe there's some that still can be produced, but you've disinfected most of them. And if we've got that down to a level where our stomach acid kills the rest, or it's just not known to be infective at some level, then maybe we're, we're all set. So even though I can pretty much guarantee that this glass of water at least has some algae or some maybe viruses that infect algae or that infect bacteria, there's certainly some bacteria. You know, I, I drank from it earlier. I have bacteria in my mouth, so now there's bacteria in the water. There's sources of bacteria and other living things. Plus, our dishwasher, even though it will inactivate a fair amount of stuff and the soap we use, it's not going to get everything. And yet, I'm confident in drinking it because it's been disinfected. And I'm confident that it's not contaminated to a point where we have infectious levels. So let's think about disinfection in terms of a treatment train. I'll move the fish out of the way for a minute. So if we consider this, this figure we've seen a few times now, where we have a typical surface water treatment plant, where we have some source of water, we take it through these processes we've discussed so far, got sedimentation, coagulation, flocculation, more sedimentation, um, probably combined with a filtration step. Sometimes we can do either or, oftentimes both. Then we add the disinfection, uh, disinfectant. And so here, what we see is we're dosing it, just like we dosed coagulant. That coagulant dosing was just a rapid mix, small chamber, we just adding it into the mixture and making sure it's well mixed. Pretty much the same thing with the disinfectant. We're injecting it. Um, if we're doing a chemical, we're injecting it. And then what you see here, it looks like a plug flow reactor, right? The, the water is going to flow through something like that. And it's going to act like a plug flow. So one thing to keep in mind is disinfection systems are often going to be plug flow reactors. Not always, um, but, but certainly often. Um, Sometimes we add fluoride after that. That's something that um, we'll talk about a little more in a little bit. And then in addition to that, a lot of times we adjust to make sure that we have good residual chlorine um, so that in our distribution system, which is in some way acting like an extension of our disinfection contactor, that distribution system stays clean enough and protective and allows for a little bit of residual chlorine to be uh, coming out of our taps. Uh, and ideally, we design that so that it's the right amount and nothing um, too, too chlorinated. Okay, so for disinfection, um, the dose and the type of pathogen are, are really important. So if we have some pathogen that is particularly dangerous, particularly infective, um, and maybe we have something that's particularly resistant, we want to make sure that we are accounting for these factors. So as we consider the types, like the general classifications, I'll talk through a few examples here. So first we have viruses. Viruses are, you know, I guess this for over the past year, probably everybody's increased their knowledge about viruses generally, right? So we, we have uh, the coronavirus everywhere. Now, it turns out the coronavirus, um, we would not typically consider that a waterborne disease in terms of uh, having concern that it's going to be in our drinking water and we get sick because we drink it. Now, it is true that it can infect our intestines and that's often a, a way, um, something that does happen and we can actually because of that, we can usually detect it in uh, sewage. Uh, we can collect sewage samples and detect the DNA there, and even sometimes predict sickness before um, the actual sickness is manifesting and testing in clinical settings. Um, our environmental group, Dr. John Pardue, is leading a, kind of a sewer surveillance system at LSU um, with that very concept. So that's pretty interesting. Um, 
So viruses, most of the waterborne viruses are going to be long lasting in water and have some way of getting from a previous host into a, a new host, right? So the coronavirus is spread airborne and it does not li live very long in water. Even in like purified water that's like comfortable for most pathogens or most, most um, organisms, the coronavirus really only lasts about 24 hours. Um, most of it will die off by, uh, by a day or two um, in water. Whereas something like the norovirus is a big problem for eating raw oysters because it lasts in water for a very long time. And you can have potentially um, sick people with norovirus discharging wastewater upstream that goes out um, and eventually flows over oyster beds. Those oysters are grabbing all these nutrients and particles. And as they're doing that, norovirus can get concentrated in the oyster itself. And then if you eat the oyster raw, then you've not disinfected it and you will have a bad time that, that evening, um, potentially. So, and that's not just norovirus, rotavirus can probably do that, poliovirus, another one. And we see here again, that concept of the fecal oral route of transmission becomes very important and understanding how these pathogens work and in terms of being in our water, whether or not they can be, how they would get there, how many uh, would be very important. Okay, so another example would be Vibrio cholera and that we have, um, we'll talk about uh, kind of one of our first encounters with that on a kind of a scientific basis in a slide or two. I think these bacteria here are cholera um, although I can't remember which, which ones they are. Um, but we have E. coli, Salmonella, different species there. And some E. coli are worse than others. Some will produce toxins that can make us sick. Some will um, be more pathogenic than others. So we, we work with some E. coli in my lab that are considered non-pathogenic strains. Um, there's an interesting distinction here in terms of food poisoning and food infection. Most, most times where you, you think you got like a stomach bug or our generic term where you say, oh, I had food poisoning, usually that's actually food infection. Um, that's usually some bacteria or virus that um, gets into your stomach and then into your intestines and starts growing and it's a different type of bacteria and maybe it's growing in, a, in the wrong spot and your stomach is reacting to it because it's not supposed to be there and it kind of flushes your system trying to get rid of it. Um, a food poisoning event is when you eat some food that has had toxins produced by some microorganism, could be bacteria, could be a fungus, um, but that, that toxin itself, that uh, it essentially created a poison. That's what happens if you eat canned food that has gone bad, let's say for um, botulinum poisoning, which is a very, very bad toxin. We, we actually can use it for you know, Botox treatment for wrinkles or whatever. It uh, can be quite useful in, if you dose it in the right amounts in the right places, we can make use of it, but it, it causes that um, essentially nerve damage to prevent, or, you know, which is why it will relax your wrinkles. But if you ingest it, it's pretty awful, right? It kills people um, very rapidly, para can cause paralysis, all of that nasty stuff. And so one, one of the things to consider here is a food infection can be treated if you, or can be prevented if you disinfect the food, um, you cook it properly, you disinfect your water. Um, but a food poisoning, or I guess maybe it could happen in water, but not, not so common, you would have to make sure the toxin is not there. So if you did have some really old meat or something, and you decided, well, maybe it's okay, I'll cook it, uh, should be fine. Well, if there was a toxin that was produced inside there, even if you sterilize everything, even if you um, disinfect it well enough, if the toxin is still there, you're still gonna have a problem, right? So that's why we, we don't just say, oh, well, cook it enough and then it'll be fine. Maybe if it's like a week old and it still smells good and you're just kind of not sure, yeah, maybe cook it a little extra, just to be on that safe side in terms of disinfection, 
but the the poisoning risk is a different factor there. Okay, so bacteria, these usually, um, let me just write a few, uh, well, I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, okay, so protozoa, uh, that's a third class here. These are like bacteria, except they're larger, and they tend to be eukaryotic. If you remember from biology, eukaryotic means they have cell walls, whereas bacteria are prokaryotic. Hoping I'm spelling this right. Um, and the prokaryotic, they have a, a membrane, a cell membrane, that is a little bit protective and sometimes they can form cysts, but the eukaryotic protozoa, which includes amoeba and other, other things we would call parasitic, uh, like parasites, cryptosporidium and giardia. The, um, that cryptosporidium outbreak, by the way, um, in your required reading, this is that organism. And they can form um, cysts that are kind of like really almost egg-like, except it's just the cell. Um, but they're really hard to disinfect because they're, they're hardened to resist environmental factors. That's why the, these things can do it, so they can last longer in the environment. So I have a quote here saying that the dose makes the poison, uh, which is very true, and it applies to infections as well because we have to have enough pathogens to make an infective dose, right? That, that concept of if you just have one, one cell of Vibrio cholera, it's not going to make you sick. You know, even if they multiply pretty quickly, you go from one to two to, to four to eight and so on, if they're doubling every few hours, some some organisms can replicate fast enough that that becomes a problem with only a few but vibrio cholera happens to be very uh, susceptible to stomach acid so the amount of cholera required is actually something like a million or so cells it actually takes quite a lot of cells to make an infection whereas norovirus apparently only takes somewhere between, I don't know, five or 10 and 50 viruses. Now a virus, the way it replicates is a little bit different than a bacteria, right? A bacteria splits in half and you have two. A virus infects a cell, uh, takes over its infrastructure and commands it to build millions of new viruses. And so one virus that effectively uh, gets one cell, suddenly it bursts and then you have 10 million new viruses that are all about to go do the same thing. So viruses act on a different manner. They can replicate a lot faster. Um, they are they tend to be a little more resistant to pH. So cholera, pH, vulnerable, we'll say. I just spelled that out. So our stomach acid is rather acidic, right? We've got hydrochloric acid in our stomach, and that acid can kill cholera reasonably well. Um, likewise, E. coli and salmonella are probably in the thousands to ten thousands in terms of the infectious infective dose. I think rotavirus is somewhere similar. I don't remember poliovirus. Cryptosporidium happens to be like three to five cells. Okay, so there's a few things that are interesting here. In terms of having just three to five cells here, well, as an organism, it um, the organism has to uh, infect the body and create more cells and then discharge these cells, get into the some sort of a, a water source and then be consumed again. And so one thing that's important is how many of these pathogens are being produced by the human body or by an animal and discharged. Um, I'm going to come to your question in just a second. <clears throat> so one thing to, to note is for like for viruses, they actually produce quite a lot of viral load 
and those are discharged. Viruses are pretty vulnerable in the environment. They have very little protection compared to like a cryptosporidium cyst, for example. Um, so the um, one thing to consider here is how many of these organisms are getting out into the wild. Um, Vibrio cholera, for example, is so vulnerable, but, and, and because of that, I guess, in some way, it ends up producing a whole lot of new cells. So the um, pathogen load discharged by somebody sick with cholera is enormous, um, just to give it a chance at infecting somebody else. Okay, so question here, um, does a virus use proteins available in the body to reproduce, or does it have um, more to do with DNA or RNA? And it's a good question. I think typically what it was, <laughs> nice. I think the typical way it works is it's going to, the let's say it's infecting a human. Um, the human, the, the proteins, the amino acids, the materials that are available in the human body um, in, are normally being used to create, by, by a given cell, to create proteins and to create different functions to um, to create new components of the cell if they've been damaged or whatever. So normally our cells are producing some stuff. In the case of a viral infection, that particular cell, it essentially has these production units taken over and it's starting to produce proteins that often, often what a, a virus will do is insert its instructions into the DNA of the cell. It's like a kind of like a computer virus, right? You insert that code, and now that computer is producing a different type of protein, and it produces lots of these proteins that end up self-assembling back into a new virus. And so the new virus, um, all these little proteins come together and make these new viruses, and they go, and when, once the cell lyses or uh, splits apart, they go out into um, find other cells to infect. And I think that some of them are worked a little bit differently than others. Um, yeah, so it, it's not, it, mutating is close to correct. I think, I think it's more like commandeering. Um, it's it's um, pirating or something. You know, it's taking over the cell and telling it to do something different than what it was doing, using, it, if, using the cell's own mechanics. Okay, so. One thing you might be wondering, with all this discussion about how many viruses does it take to, uh, to infect somebody, let me ask you, how do you think we know that? How do you think we know that it only takes three to five crypto cells to get somebody sick? Have you tried it? Have you thought to yourself, hmm, I wonder how many viruses I need to eat before I get sick? Well, it, it turns out, um, and, and if you do have some ideas, um, <laughs> feel free to put them out here. It turns out that the CDC sometimes does uh, trial studies. Yeah, somebody has to try it. Um, so the CDC would do these uh, voluntary trials where they, they would go out, and I, I wish I had come across these opportunities when I was a college student, because what they'll do is they'll be like, okay, we need volunteers for a study. Um, what we're gonna do is feed you for a week, give you a nice place to stay for a week. Um, we take care of all your meals. It's gonna be like a hotel. It'll be great. Um, and we're gonna give you a thousand bucks to do this. Um, anybody wanna join? And, and what they're doing is they're saying, okay, we're gonna give you an unknown amount of norovirus, okay? And then we're going to monitor you. We're going to take care of your health. We're going to see what happens. And the lucky ones get the thousand bucks and get a placebo, which is just basically sugar with no bacteria, with no virus or bacteria or whatever. So literally, they would they would do this, and you have to do it to enough people because sometimes you'll just have you'll be asymptomatic. You'll get you get the infection, but it's not manifesting as anything in your body. Your body's not reacting to it. It's it's fighting it off or whatever, but it's. It's an asymptomatic infection. That does happen. So some portion will be lucky and asymptomatic. Some portion will be lucky and be the placebo. And then the unfortunate folks are just going to have a week dealing with some sickness in bed and 
you know, moving on with their life later. Um, really, I'm always quite amused that that's, that's actually legitimately how we learned this. Um, and it turns out that, you know, it, it's hard to know exactly, but it takes a handful of crypto cells to actually make somebody sick. Um, which is why it's it's not uncommon to get something like this if you're going hiking and you drink from some water. It looks pretty clean, but you know maybe there's a cow pasture that um, or some animal nearby that defecated, and there's a couple spores in there, and you ended up getting some. Um, things like that can happen. So I always find it fascinating that that's that's the way um, people learned and. Uh, yeah, it, how many of you would, would sign up for that? Just out of curiosity. A thousand bucks, would you would you go for it? Okay, so while you, while you think about that and give me an answer, um, the next thing I wanna say, <laughs> it's easy, I'll do it in a heartbeat. <laughs> Especially if you could like, you know, have whatever your, your choice of uh, entertainment, right? As, as long as you had the internet and your source of entertainment, and <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to get hooked up with the placebo, yeah. Uh, that would be the, the best play. Um, okay, so I want to tell you about somebody who um, is probably not actually related to me. Um, okay, um, that's a good question. I'll, let me, let me, I'll come back to Jon Snow here. Um, how often is boiling water in nature effective in fully disinfecting? Boiling water is an excellent choice. Um, if you're out camping or something, I would, I would highly recommend doing that. The, the challenge would be you're not getting sterility just by boiling. So there is a chance that some stuff will be resistant, at least for some amount of boiling. So what you'd probably want to do is make sure it's boiling and actually got to a full boil and stayed there for a few minutes. Um, at that point, it's probably very effective and um, really a, a great thing to do. Now, in terms of developing countries, so you think about like going and hiking or camping and needing a point of use treatment for whatever water you have. Um, boiling is an excellent option, but it costs fuel. And when you're out hiking, there's plenty of um, dead wood around, Fire, firewood is pretty easy, maybe you're set up. But if you're making a living somewhere that doesn't have access to clean water, chances are you don't have good access to fuel either, uh, or cheap access. And so boiling water is great in some cases, but it's not very sustainable for somebody that, that really needs to do this on a continual basis, because it's also not pleasant to have to heat up the water, boil it, spend all that energy and cost, and all the smoke that you're gonna be breathing you know, from the fire, and then let it cool down just so you can drink it, or cook with it, or whatever. So it's um, it is great, but it's not sufficient for um, for some applications, we'll say. Okay, so Jon Snow. Um, you may know him from Game of Thrones as the dude who knows nothing, but that's actually J-O-N. Um, and in fact, my brother is Jon Snow. Um, Jonathan, but he goes by Jon sometimes. So literally, my, my brother knows nothing. Um, only partly true there. Okay, but this guy, Jon Snow with an H, is known as the father of epidemiology. Um, and the reason was for a cholera outbreak that he investigated in, like, in the 1850s. Um, in London, you may have heard this before, but the, uh, there was this outbreak and Jon Snow was kind of a doctor, physician, research type. Um, and he was trying to figure out what was causing this cholera outbreak because it was very interesting that it, it was really only affecting um, some region. And the, the going um, theory was that there was this, um, this stink or the, what they call the miasma of uh, kind of the grimy parts of town was attributed to it, um, why people got this plague. You know, in, this was back when people really didn't have a concept of germs. We didn't know how people got sick. And it's kind of a, a impressive to think that was only about 150 years ago, right? 170. And so this 
um, this Dr. John Snow <coughs> um, really was a, an important component in the development of the germ theory of disease. So essentially what happened was, I think, I, yeah, what happened was there was this neighborhood. <coughs> By the way, this is all documented in a narrative form that has been dramatized a little bit. So it's like a historical fiction, but not really. The, it, the only fictitious thing about it is that they added some conversation or some, some uh, dialogue that we don't know exactly what people said. So it, it reads like a story, but it's pretty much the exact story that happened um, just with some, some added filler. So it's a really easy, entertaining, interesting, and gripping story. Um, a quick read, I highly recommend it, The Ghost Map. Um, this is the story of Jon Snow, um, um, who, by the way, he never had any children. So it, if I'm related, it's, it's some uh, a more distant connection than directly. So essentially, this area of London um, was where the outbreak was happening. And if you see these little squares, these black squares, each of the black squares represents what, and really, you'll see some that are like kind of small, and then some that look like they have several layers added to them, like that. Those each represent one person who died in at that address. So the crazy thing about cholera is it infects, and once somebody's infected and actively sick, it is brutal how quickly it, um, it takes effect. And the, what it does is essentially it infects the, the small intestine um, and maybe the large intestine too, um, and reverses it, it. The bacteria excretes something. Um, yeah, it, it excretes something that causes the intestinal lining to reverse processes. So normally the intestines are pulling water from all the stuff that's in your intestine out into the bloodstream and to extract water to extract all that liquid that we're drinking. And whatever moisture is in our food. And uh, if, it, if that process is reversed and goes the other way, then it's taking water from your bloodstream and from your body and causing you to excrete it. So there's, there's a common, commonly known cholera cots, which is basically a bed that lets you um, more easily manage a continual uh, issue of diarrhea, and it's just a really awful time for the person who's sick. Now, having diarrhea like that is not the worst of things if you can stay hydrated. So if you can stay hydrated, the disease will be self-limited. It's discharging lots and lots and lots of these bacteria into whatever bucket or stream that you're discharging to, um, which is why I mentioned earlier, it takes a lot of these bacteria to get somebody sick. And so the disease itself discharges and is kind of designed in a way to discharge lots of its, lots of new bacteria for it to propagate. So the fact that it reverses your hydration system and dehydrates you, you can die of dehydration pretty rapidly. So if you are sick with cholera and you don't know about hydration and how to keep somebody hydrated, it is lethal. So some people could be living, walking, happy, and get sick, and then within 24 hours deteriorate so badly that they they die. Um, so it, it can it can kill people really quickly. Um, however, it's almost not an issue today. If I mean it's an issue, nobody wants to be sick. But in terms of um, the lethality, it's very reduced because we have um, intravenous needles, so IV drips to provide hydration. We have hydration salts. We know that the right thing to do is to provide more water, not starve them of water, because back then people didn't know. Um, so you just do whatever felt right, felt logical, your best guess, right? So there's lots and lots of people dying, really unfortunate. And you can see that some households had lots of people, maybe multiple families and lots and lots of deaths. And essentially by mapping the deaths, Jon Snow was the first one to really take 
what we call an epidemiological approach to, to track diseases based on, um, to, to map them according to how prevalent they are, where they were occurring. Um, so if you take this into a three-dimensional thing and put red dots, you can see here um, kind of a, a better view of it. Now, the blue flags here are really important. These are different wells um, for water. And so the thing that ultimately Jon Snow realized was you can kind of map based on which wells people were taking water from. And it turns out that the Broad Street pump right here was an enormous problem. And they ultimately figured out that there was an infant living in the uh, apartment that was just above that pump. And that infant had been traveling recently, um, had been brought uh, back to London from a trip or something. And that infant had cholera. And interestingly, infants are less susceptible and typically live for longer, even if they do succumb to it, they do live longer. And so there is an infant and it turns out that their latrine was directly over the pump, which is not a good design, right? This is really before proper indoor plumbing and proper sewage carriage systems. So it was an awful situation where this one infant was infecting the, the pump here because the this pump was really only a few meters deep, um, the well was. Um, and so by removing the handle to that pump so that nobody could get water from here anymore, Jon Snow ended the, this epidemic here. Okay, so you've got a question, if the water is infected and you need to stay hydrated to fight the infection, you're pretty much out of luck. Well, in a way, yes, but in another way, once your body's already fighting the infection, it's drinking more of it is not necessarily going to be a, um, a terrible thing. Uh, obviously, it would be best to not get reinfected or not add more infective bacteria there. So in a, in a sense, that is true, but it would, be, it would be better to stay hydrated even with an infected water or um, water that contains stuff than to just not have water altogether. Um, but yeah, that, that was part of the thing. So once, once you remove that pump or really the handle to the pump, and that's on display now in London on Broad Street, so the Broad, Broad Street pump, um, the epidemic died away really quickly. Um, and so that was a pretty, a pretty cool story I wanted to share there, um, about Dr. John Snow. Okay. So disinfection, um, I want to talk about some of the technologies and strategies we use. So an alternative to just removing that pump, um, from functioning would have been to disinfect that well, right? And to disinfect the water taken from that well. And by the way, I meant to mention um, about the uh, that infant causing the problem and about how cholera works. If you had to drink some cholera infected water, and you were forced to, you should definitely do it on an empty stomach because cholera is very vulnerable to stomach acid. And that's why it takes so many for them to have a chance at infecting an adult. So if you're concerned, and you can get cholera from uh, raw oysters as well, if there, if, the, if there was some cholera in the water um, that the oysters were filtered. So if you do eat raw oysters, I recommend you do so on an empty stomach. Um, if they are gonna give you some infection or they do have some diseases in them, uh, it at least helps, helps your chances a little bit for letting your stomach kill the stuff before going on and giving you an infection. Of course, sometimes it's sometimes eating raw oysters does nothing if they don't happen to have any diseases. But it's a, a gamble that I personally don't think I'm interested in taking. Uh, so I'm just passing that that advice here to you. Okay, so disinfection strategies and technologies. Well, first would be free chlorine. Uh, we call it free chlorine, and we this is basically the the generic reactive chlorine, the stuff you find in your uh, household bleach. I don't know that I have ever eaten a raw oyster. Um, 
I might have, but I'm not sure. I, I have had ceviche, which is, um, which may have contained the oysters. It's basically seafood and shellfish. <laughs> well, how do you know? <laughs> um, you, you would have known that I'm not from Louisiana if I had ever uh, passed out um, passed out exams or something, and I tried to to say your Louisiana names because I'm I'm not very good at that, and it's kind of kind of funny. Yeah, I have had some some really good charbroiled oysters um, here. Yeah, garlic butter, and I don't I don't love spicy stuff. Again, not from Louisiana, um, but. But I do like the garlic butter and parmesan or cheese or something. But yeah, may, I might I might try raw, raw oysters sometime. We'll see. Uh, but if I do, I'm doing it on an empty stomach. Okay, so free chlorine is the the um, kind of generic choice for disinfectants as far as chemical disinfectants go, and you can apply it in terms of it, by means of chlorine gas. Um, Obviously, keeping a gaseous substance that is super oxidizing is not a very safe or easy thing to do, so that's not super common. Sometimes it may make sense. Um, a lot more often, we keep it as sodium hypochlorite, which is, you'll see this in your household bleach, or calcium hypochlorite, which will be CaOCl2. And essentially, what's going to happen is these are going to, you know, for the for the case of chlorine gas, it would be Cl2 plus water um, end up yielding Cl minus and HOCl and H plus. So if we do chlorine gas, we actually are adding some acid. Um, we're getting that HOCl, and that's just that reaction between chlorine gas and water. Now, remember that after this happens, or or after we add, let's say, NaOCl, this will go to Na plus and OCl minus. So either way we do it, what we're looking at is complete dissociation when we first apply it. And track with me here, because it's easy to make mistakes when we solve chlorine problems in particular when you don't recognize what's happening. So what happens is we apply our chlorine in some way, it completely dissociates first. We get that forward arrow, forward reaction. That's key because we're gonna add some known quantity of this stuff and it's all going to become some form of the free chlorine, okay? The free chlorine being HOCl and OCl minus. Then once we've added it, then we have the equilibrium reaction we've talked about before. So OCl minus and H plus are in equilibrium with HOCl. So keep in mind that regardless of which form it adds as, it will quickly then go to equilibrium. So after that, after we've made one form or the other, then we get this balance, okay? So we add it all first, we then maybe we adjust the pH or whatever, but based on the pH, we know how much chlorine is going to be there um, or how much of each form. So keep that in mind. We add it first. That's going to give us our total. Then it's that total amount is going to separate into two categories. Okay. Um, another type of chlorine would be what we call chlorine combined chlorine. And this is when we have some sort of chlorine, so OCl minus, for example, and amine groups, which is like ammonia, ammonia type things or molecules that contain ammonia in them, like a, an amine group, these will react and form chloramines, which are essentially um, NH2Cl or something like that. Um, there's a, a few different forms. So these chloramines, they're a little bit less reactive, and these are what we use for residual disinfectants. So these are what we call our residual chlorine. So when we talk about combined chlorine, it has been combined with some ammonia, some nitrogen, 
And if we have lots of nitrate or, nit um, or nitrite or ammonia in our water when we treat it with chlorine, a lot of it's going to form chloramines. In fact, if you've ever been swimming in a swimming pool and you, it smells really strongly of chlorine and it's like stinging your eyes when you open your eyes underwater, that's actually not the free chlorine that was applied. What you're feeling and experiencing is the combined chlorine, which smells worse, it stings your eyes worse, and it has less of an effect on disinfection because it's slower. And the worst part is it's the reason it's there is because somebody peed in the pool or somebody was sweating a lot in the pool. Let's just pretend it's all sweat, right? Not much better. Um, the reason I say that is because normally when we fill up a pool with water, we're not really adding much in the way of ammonia or ammonia containing compounds. And so then the only other source would be a biological source when we go swimming and add to it. So if your, your pool is smelling really strongly of chlorine and all of that, it doesn't mean the chlorine is overdosing. It might mean that um, you've got some chloramines there. So some more food for thought here. All right, so chlorine dioxide is another form of chlorine. It's going to act a lot like free chlorine, um, but it's in the form of ClO2. Um, we'll just say kind of similar. And sometimes it's probably categorized with free chlorine in terms of how reactive it is. Okay, so that takes care of all the different forms of chlorine. Um, then we have ozone. Ozone, you've heard about, we like it up in the upper atmosphere where it protects us from ultraviolet light. Um, it is a natural oxidant, so we don't like it in our troposphere here where we breathe it and it gives us irritated lungs. Okay, so it is in some sense toxic because it's oxidative. Uh, it's a gas, we can bubble it into the water and use it as a dissolved gas to disinfect stuff. Um, and it is fairly strong on its own if we get a decent concentration of ozone. Um, but sometimes we'll actually use it in combination with ultraviolet light. Um, that would be jumping to part six here. Sometimes we'll use it with UV and I'll explain that in a moment. So ultraviolet light would be our number five here in terms of disinfecting. Um, I mentioned it earlier, but essentially the, the goal here is to cause the DNA in microorganisms to stop functioning so that they are no longer able to replicate properly. Um, if we can do that, then we can disinfect um, pretty well. Now, the sixth component, we call it advanced oxidation. There's a variety of ways to do this, um, and it would certainly work to disinfect something, but we actually use it for other things, not just disinfection. If we want to get rid of some chemical that's in the water, um, and we don't want to filter down to like reverse osmosis levels to get rid of it, we can actually add ultraviolet light plus hydrogen peroxide or ozone, or maybe even chlorine if we do the right um, type of ultraviolet light, then this is going to essentially split these molecules in half and create what's called radicals. Um, so really highly reactive radicals. Um, OH radicals, for example, and other ones. And these radicals will go and destroy just about anything they come in contact with. So they, they're super reactive and um, will certainly disinfect, but it, like I, I make this little note here, it's not just for disinfection. So ultraviolet light, in terms of uh, human harm, I think I'm going to go into this in more depth next time, but just kind of a, a quick preview. There's different types of ultraviolet light, and this is actually one of my uh, research focus areas, so I have, have plenty to say here. Um, if you go into high enough energy, so we call it lower wavelength because there's shorter gaps between the waves, um, a longer wavelength means there's fewer um, fewer waves striking some surface over time. If it's going like that, 
the amount of waves that this thing is experiencing, if it's a long wavelength, it's slow. If it's a short wavelength, it's really fast, right? The waves coming through and it's higher energy. Um, even though it's traveling at the same speed, more waves are hitting it. And that's how X-rays work, right? X-rays are really, really fast. So fast our, our eyes can't see them. Um, if you consider red light versus purple light, purple is actually much higher intensity, higher energy than red light. Um, so we'll, we'll talk more about that and how that works. But essentially, if you get into the right category of ultraviolet light, obviously we cannot see that with our eyes. If you get into the right category, we call it germicidal, which means DNA absorbs light in that area. So if we're doing the germicidal stuff, yes, that's not good for humans to experience because that type of light will denature, mutate DNA, and potentially cause cancer um, and other stuff. So that's very hazardous, very bad. Um, however, that level of light does not make it through our atmosphere to us. So when we're considering being outside in the sun and concerned about ultraviolet light, that type of light is all absorbed very strongly by ozone, which is why we care about the ozone layer, and by oxygen, so O2. So if we take a germicidal ultraviolet lamp and shine it indoors, it can only go a few feet. Um, it will attenuate by, uh, by absorption by oxygen, and it's not going to go very far through the room unless it's really, really intense. And even then, it's still going to be dropping off in intensity. So it's not that type of light that we are worried about. It's actually what we would call UVB. So it's between like the UVA, which is like just barely ultraviolet, and that's like the black light type stuff. It can cause stuff to fluoresce. It can kind of be fun. It can help your skin tan. But the UVB is kind of where we have um, some of these advanced oxidation type stuff. We have some chemicals in our skin that will react based on that, the energy from the light and it will cause an oxidized spot or maybe it will create a radical of some sort. So then we need antioxidants because it's, that process is creating these disruptions, these oxidative disruptions. This can happen a little bit in the UVA where we're th we think more of skin tans, but it especially happens in that UVB range. And so what we want to do is protect ourselves from that harmful type of stuff. Now, this is also why our skin produces more pigment if we've been exposed to some ultraviolet light, because that pigment itself is an antioxidant, reacts really quickly with these radicals. So antioxidants, um, So these react quickly and will quench the radicals. So let's do it that way. And so these radicals, it can be all sorts of things. Okay, so with that being said, uh, where would the sunlight fall in the UVA spectrum? You know, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to um, be sure that I include that next time when we talk about UV light and show you a, a spectrum. Or I might have a chance at the end of this lecture. Let me, let me continue. I'll come back to that. Um, it's a good question. Most, most of what we receive is UVA. Um, okay, so chlorination. I want to give you, um, I want to come back to chlorination and focus in here a little bit because that's most of what we'll be doing in terms of problems and most of what happens in applications is chlorine and is in particular free chlorine. So one thing to keep in mind here is that HOCl is the stronger form. I may have mentioned this earlier in the semester, but this is this is a concept that we've kind of been building to so that we can really understand how well a disinfection system is going to work given the, the pH conditions of the water. Because we remember that we have HOCl in equilibrium with OCl minus and H plus. 
So this H plus here really tells us that the, acid, the amount of acid, the amount of H plus in the water is going to control how much is in one side or the other. So if we add acid, if, so, so if we are doing pH down, meaning H plus up, remember that's kind of like an inverse type relationship there. So if that's the case, it's pushing more that way because as we add here, it's pushing that system left. Um, and you can also think about it like, like this. Under acidic conditions, lots of H around, this guy would rather have an H than not. So if there's lots, if there's plenty of extra H pluses around, they'll go ahead and combine and hang out as HOCl. So under acidic conditions, we have more HOCl. And that's why we try to arrange our disinfection systems to typically have something like pH 5 to 6 range. We don't have to go all the way down into you know, pH 2 or 3 or something. Um, when we can get most of the chlorine as HOCl at pH 5 or 6. So um, that brings us to an example question. And I think we've looked at things similar to this in the past. The fish can go on a little bigger. So we have this problem and it says, um, so this an example here, if 15 milligrams per liter of HOCl is added to a potable water for disinfection and the final measured pH is seven, so exactly neutral, what percent of HOCl is not dissociated? Assume the temperature is 25 degrees Celsius. So that's just that temperature thing. That's just because the, the Ka value is temperature dependent. We're not going to bother with that. I'm just going to tell you that it's 10 to the negative 7.54. We'll just solve it that way. Okay. Um, so go ahead and start working on this problem. And let me just say here, well, I'll, I'll explain in a moment, actually. I'm going to go ahead and give you a couple moments to start working on this. I'm going to try to pull up a uh, picture to show you guys later about the, the sunlight and UV range. Um, but go ahead and start working on this. We'll solve it together in just a minute. I'm just setting up Excel real quick. Um, while you guys work on that, feel free to ask any questions. I will give you some guidance in a moment, but I want to give you a chance to take a look for yourself. So you guys probably are 
looking this up if you're working on it, but the molecular weight of HOCl you'll need, and that is uh, 52.46 grams per mole. Okay, so I've got a few things written down in my spreadsheet here. So just uh, real quickly, the HOCl we know that was added was 15 milligrams per liter. We know the pH is 7. Our question really is how, what percent of HOCl is left as HOCl, so it is not dissociated. And we have the molecular weight and the Ka that I gave. Um, and I just solve 10 to the negative 7.5 for them. Okay, so um, how do we begin? Hopefully you have some idea, um, even if this is, you know, maybe you've never fully got a grip on these types of problems. I hope that you have a bit of an idea of how to approach something like this. So we have the pH, we have the dissociation, we remember from just a moment ago that we have that equilibrium reaction where you know, HOCl is dissociating and in equilibrium with H plus and OCl minus. So when I say dissociate, um, and when the, this problem says dissociate, what we're talking about is the dissociation side of the reaction is when this HOCl dissociates into the two components, right? So you could also say these products are associating back into, I'm so sorry, I've got this. Oh, no, no, you're fine. <laughs> I have the, um, on my screen, I have my Excel sheet in front of part of the display. But anyway, um, for a moment there, I thought it was in front of your display as well. Okay, so you could call this the dissociation and then maybe you could call the association as the reaction going the other way because you're associating these two together and creating a, a new thing. Now, I don't, I don't think I've seen association, how much have it has associated. I don't think I've seen that written anywhere, but just in a way to think about it, that's what we're talking about is a dissociation reaction and an association reaction or a uh, backwards reaction. So think about it that way in terms of understanding what the problem is talking about. So we add a known amount of this and then we're asking, well, at pH seven, how much of that is in one form or the other? And actually it says what percent. So we don't actually need the molecular weight. Um, we can solve for it, and maybe we'll go ahead and do that, but we didn't really need the molecular weight because we can remember we have our equation that describes Ka is equal to the products over the reactant, so H plus and multiply here, don't forget this is always multiplication for this equation, times OCl minus, and these are both to the one power, right, because we just have one in each of these, so don't need to do anything fancy there, um, divided by HOCl. So we know this is the relationship. So given that we know the pH, we can actually solve this in terms of the ratios for HOCl and OCl minus. So we could say, um, and this is essentially what we did as a, a, one of the chemistry problems on the on exam number one. So really, I, I think you should be able to do this and hopefully you were able to do this on your own here. Um, so 
And what we can do then is solve for what percent of the total is going to be as HOCL. What I'm gonna do is multiply HOCL by both sides, divide OCL minus by both sides, and divide KA by both sides, or divide both sides by KA, right? So we get H plus divided by KA. So this gives us the ratio here, the ratio of HOCL to OCL minus, and we have, we have that um, in comparison or equivalent to the acid divided by the, the Ka. So we can say this ratio is 10 to the negative 7, because that's pH 7, divided by 10 to the negative 7.54. And if we do this in Excel, Correct. That'll, that'll give us the ratio of the um, ratio, I guess, the portion of HOCL that has not dissociated. So let's say that's going to be equal to the, um, 10 to the negative 7 and divide that by our Ka. So that'll give us a ratio of 3.47. So let's write that down here. This is equal to 3.467. And you could say that's 3.467 times the amount of HOCL compared to OCL minus. And there's actually a couple ways we can, uh, we can solve this. So with that ratio, um, we, we can solve from there, what, what is that in terms of the total amount? So for example, um, we could say, and this is, this part, if I solve it this way that I've, I've started to do so, um, which is like I'll show you in a moment, this is not the only way to do it, but in my mind this popped into, popped into this came to mind as one way to do it. So we could say that um, it's 3.46 times the amount. We could also say 3.46 um, to 1. Right? And so we could say the total equals 4.467, because that's 1 plus this. And so we could say the percent is going to be equal to 3.467 divided by 4.467 times 100%. And that should give us our answer. We could also use um, use the actual numbers. We could solve given that 15 milligrams per liter and find it that way with real numbers here rather than just uh, proportions. And so one, one way to write this out would be solving for HOCL divided by HOCL plus OCL minus. times 100%. And really, that's effectively the same thing that I've done here. Yes, I'll, I'll explain that in just a moment. Um, let me let me solve this and see what that says. And I'll come back to that and explain. So we'll say this percentage equals this divided by this plus 1. Um, and we'll multiply that by 100%. So answer here would be 
0.6%. So even at a neutral pH, we're getting something like 77% of our chlorine is in the, the kind we want. So just putting it a little more acidic gets it even further there. Okay, so let me explain here. Um, what was I talking about? How did I come up with this 4.467? Essentially, I was doing this. I just did it later in the problem. Um, so what I did was I said the ratio, we have some ratio for every 3.467 of HOCl. So let me, let me write this this to be a little more clear. This portion here is equivalent to this, right? Because that's just what I put here, which is equivalent to 3.467, which is the same thing as saying 3.467 divided by 1. So I arbitrarily said that, well, I'm going to treat it as if HOCl equals this and OCl minus equals this that algebraically is fine. And because I'm just looking at a proportion here, I can do that. If I needed an exact amount, then I need to use this exact amount and use the molecular weight and do the conversion um, and get there. Sorry, we'll, we'll put the fish away for now. Does that, does that answer your question? Does that make sense? In, if, I, if I decide to make, make use of this equation here, then what I can do is I can, uh, I can say that our total equals 70 or 15, excuse me, 15 milligrams per liter as HOCl. And then I can convert this to the molecular weight and get some um, molar, molar units for total. And then I could put that portion in here while also solving for um, yeah, okay, so let me, let me write that out better. So I can get that total. So the total equals total is HOCl plus OCl minus, right? Um, so one thing I can do here is I can say that if I find that total, this is a discrete value, based on that, if I get the molar total, then I can say, for example, OCL minus equals the total minus HOCL. And then I can, I can get rid of one of my terms because I have a system of two equations now with one equation here and the other equation here. And so I can substitute in because I know my total and I can use this substitution to get rid of HOCl or to get rid of OCl minus. Either way, I'm getting um, a simplification so I have one variable. Now, it turns out you don't have to do that because I showed you this other way that I went through and used an arbitrary number in this case. And then given that percentage, I could calculate the, the uh, molecular, um, the molar concentration of HOCl that we added and use that percentage to apply to say how much is one or the other. So I could certainly do that. Um, maybe I'll come back to this next time if there's any questions. I know I wasn't perhaps as clear as I, I wanted to be. Um, yeah, so we'll go through this. We'll pick up here on Tuesday. There's a few more slides about chlorination. Um, that I wanted to go through. Uh, so that's, that's it for today. Um, we will pick up here next time and 
go through it a little more simplified. I was trying to be elaborate and then I just added the second way. Um, yes, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna talk about the exam. And for anybody that's interested, I'll spend one more minute talking about the, uh, the solar spectrum of light. I've got some images that we actually collected during the solar eclipse a few years ago um, in terms of the, the wavelengths and light. And I've got those ready to show you. So the exam, exam two will be on granular filtration, membrane filtration, and disinfection. So it will be simpler. Um, it will be just these three units that we're covering on this homework. Um, and the homework should be a good example. It will build on that first exam because we're going to do things in reactors, right? This disinfection, we typically apply in a plug flow reactor. Maybe we'll do it in a CSTR. Maybe we'll compare the two. We're going to make use of some of the principles. We're doing chemistry right now that we started out learning, right? So, and reminding everybody. Uh, so it will be cumulative in that sense, but the membranes will be entirely new. The, the granular filters are pretty much new and the chlorination is just going to apply some of those principles. Okay, so we're doing, uh, we're doing uh, disinfection, which takes some reactor balance. We're doing granular filtration, which is more of just straight mass balance without reactions and membrane filtration, which is similar. Uh, straight mass balances with no reactions, but with a few added equations for flux and stuff like that. I will update your equation sheet um, before next time or during next time. And I will be going over the homework solutions in, the, in our exam review day, which is the, the date before our exam. Um, let, me, let me pull up our syllabus just to make sure I'm not um, I'm not overthinking, missing our timing here. I, I think we've got two more lectures before the exam, right? I hope. Okay. Um, it looks like I've made a mistake, guys. Um, I, will, I will email an announcement because I know not everybody's here. Um, yeah, I think I might have to move the exam back one. I, uh, my timing has been thrown off by something. I, I guess I meant to be doing disinfection last time and I didn't realize it. Um, I'm very sorry, this normally doesn't happen. Um, let me know if there's gonna be any issues you have with moving the exam back one date to the 23rd. Um, so be thinking about that. Class is technically over now, so I, I will send an email, um, but we need, we need that extra date, um, in, in my opinion, for the exam review, so. Okay, I'm glad to see a few of you that that's fine for. I'm going to email the class because um, time time has been slipping by and I don't know what has happened to it. Okay, anybody interested? I'm going to just talk through one slide here, just as kind of an extra. Um, maybe. maybe there we go. Uh, We're just gonna, it's gonna take my computer a little while to get there. Okay, there we go. Okay, glad to hear that. Okay, so during the solar eclipse, we took some radiometer measurements and we tracked from, you know, the eclipse happened right at around uh, 1.24 p.m. It was a partial eclipse in Louisiana. Uh, we were just outside of our lab checking it out. And this is the solar spectrum. And during the eclipse, we just see a, a decrease overall in the solar spectrum. Not, not any like uh, interesting or 
new things necessarily in terms of what kind of light is making it to the surface. But what you can see is the, the wavelengths here, our visible range cuts off somewhere right around here at 400. So this would be the UV range. And we'll say this is kind of UV A here down to about 320-ish, somewhere around there, and then a little bit of UVB. And then we're down into the germicidal, it's kind of this way. Um, looks like my computer is uh, thinking really hard for some reason. Um, so germicidal is kind of this area, I would say. And then we get down to vacuum UV, which you really need a vacuum in order for it to go anywhere. And then x-rays, if we were to continue. So in terms of what the reaches us from the sunlight, you can see that on a proportion basis, we're getting lots more visible range than we are ultraviolet. Um, and we get more ultraviolet A than what we call B. And so this little tail here, that B, is really what's uh, important in terms of um, using sunscreen for that that can cause burns, can cause actual skin damage, and lead to uh, cancers that way. So thought thought you might like to see that. Um, I am planning to move the exam. We'll see you guys next time. I will send an email about the exam. Um, and again, I do apologize about that. All right. Have a good day. I'll be here for just a second longer in case there was a question about this.